1A, an oil for life. Maria Alcala of Madrid speaks for many Mediterranean people when she says that a meal without olive oil would be a bore. No one knows when the Mediterranean civilizations initially fell in love with olives. That occurred before recorded history. However, there is evidence that the cultivation of olive trees began in countries around the Mediterranean Sea in approximately 4000 BC, and 2000 years after that, people in the eastern Mediterranean region began to produce oil from olives. The Mediterranean still accounts for 99% of all world olive oil production. From ancient times until today, the basic process of producing the oil is the same. First, whole olives are crushed. Then, the liquid is separated from the solids. After that, the valuable oil is separated from the water. Many olive growers maintain their ancient traditions and still harvest the olives by hand. We harvest in the traditional way, says Don Celso, an olive farmer from Tuscany, Italy. It would be less expensive to do it with machines, but it's more a social thing. Twenty people come to help with the harvest, and we pay them in oil. The Benefits of Olive Oil Olive oil has had a variety of uses through its long history. In ancient times, olive oil was used as money and as medicine. It was even used during war, heated up and dropped down on attackers. It is still used in religious ceremonies. It is great for protecting the freshness of fish and cheese. There are even olive oil lamps and olive oil soaps. One important study showed that Mediterranean people have the lowest rate of heart disease among Western nations. This is partly associated with their frequent use of olive oil. Other studies have shown that food cooked in olive oil is healthier and that eating olive oil twice a day reduces women's risk of getting breast cancer. The world is beginning to understand its benefits, and olive oil is no longer an unusual sight at dinner tables outside the Mediterranean region. The olive oil producing countries now sell large amounts of olive oil to countries in Europe, Asia, Africa, and North and South America. Olive oil enhances the lives of people everywhere. Its benefits, recently confirmed by science, were already understood in ancient times. Mediterranean people are happy to share their secret with the world. One B. Sofrito Sensation. Puerto Rico, a Caribbean island rich in history and remarkable natural beauty, has a cuisine all its own. Immigration to the island has helped to shape its cuisine, with people from all over the world making various contributions to it. However, before the arrival of these immigrants, the island of Puerto Rico was already known as Botican and was inhabited by the Taino people. Taino cuisine included such foods as rodents with sweet chili peppers, fresh shellfish, yams, and fish fried in corn oil. Many aspects of Taino cuisine continue today in Puerto Rican cooking, but it has been heavily influenced by the Spanish, who invaded Puerto Rico in 1508, and Africans, who were initially brought to Puerto Rico to work as slaves. Taino cooking styles were mixed with ideas brought by the Spanish and Africans to create new dishes. The Spanish extended food choices by bringing cattle, pigs, goats, and sheep to the island. Africans also added to the island's food culture by introducing powerful contrasting tastes in dishes like piñon, plantains layered in ground beef. In fact, much of the food Puerto Rico is now famous for, plantains, coffee, sugar cane, coconuts, and oranges, was actually imported by foreigners to the island. A common assumption many people make about Puerto Rican food is that it is very spicy. It's true that chili peppers are popular. Aji Caballero, in particular, is a very hot chili pepper that Puerto Ricans enjoy. However, milder tastes are popular too, such as sofrito. The base of many Puerto Rican dishes, sofrito is a sauce made from chopped onions, garlic, green bell peppers, sweet chili peppers, oregano, cilantro, and a handful of other spices. It is fried in oil and then added to other dishes. How to make a basic sofrito 
Ingredients 1 yellow onion, 2 cloves garlic, 1 green bell pepper, 3 to 4 sweet chili peppers, 3 cilantro, coriander, leaves, 1 tablespoon of olive oil, 1 quarter teaspoon dried whole oregano. Directions Remove skins from onion and garlic. Clean and prepare green bell and sweet chili peppers. Wash in water. Then finally chop these ingredients, including the cilantro leaves. Place a heavy bottomed pot over low heat. Add oil and oregano. Add the chopped ingredients. Continue cooking for about three to four minutes, stirring occasionally. Two A, Song of the Humpback. Herman Melville, the writer of the famous whale story Moby Dick, wrote that humpback whales were the most lighthearted of all the whales. A favorite of whale watchers everywhere, they swim in ocean areas close to land and are active at the surface, often jumping out of the water and coming down with a great splash. They are intelligent animals and can be seen working together as they hunt schools of small fish. And if you listen closely, you might even hear one singing. Recording Gentle Giants Marine biologist Jim Darling has studied the songs of humpback whales for 25 years. While recording whale songs on a boat near Hawaii, he invited author Douglas Chadwick to experience diving with the humpback. In the water, the way Chadwick heard the whale's songs changed completely. Suddenly, I no longer heard the whale's voice in my ears. I felt it inside my head and bones. He clearly sensed the whale's silent awareness of him. The 13-meter-long giant looked him over curiously, but never harmed him. The whale then swam under the boat. It pointed its head down to the ocean floor and, with flippers extended out to its sides, began to sing. Up in the boat, Darling recorded the whale's song. Such songs may be long and complex, lasting for 30 minutes or more. They are perhaps the longest song sung by any animal. Why do they sing? Darling says that only male humpbacks sing, but for unknown reasons. It was previously thought that they sang to attract females. But scientists showed this was incorrect when they played recordings of whale songs in the ocean and no females came around. Another idea is that male humpbacks compete with each other using songs, just as other male animals do using antlers or tusks. In addition to their long and mysterious songs, humpbacks make a variety of other sounds as they interact each day. When alarmed by enemies such as killer whales, or when the feeding is especially good, the sounds they produce can be louder than an airplane engine. A Brighter Future during the days of heavy whale hunting, the world humpback population was reduced from an estimated 125,000 to around 6,000 animals. Thanks to laws against hunting, humpbacks now number perhaps 30,000 animals, although the constantly moving humpbacks are very difficult to count. However, it now seems that this mysterious singer will continue to sing for years to come. To be Dogs in a Human World The partnership between humans and dogs began perhaps 14,000 years ago. Our first interactions may have occurred when wild dogs were attracted to human garbage, or humans may have acquired the puppies of wild dogs and trained them to be obedient pets. By means of the careful selection of dog parents, humans have been able to create a wonderful variety of dogs with plenty of talents and many different looks. Here are three examples of a dog's life in the human world. The Working Dog Jacques is one of many beagles that work at airports for the U.S. government in a program known as the Beagle Brigade. Beagles were chosen for this work because of their powerful noses. Their job is to smell and alert officers to illegal fruits, vegetables, and other foods in luggage or in mail. They do the job far better than humans could alone. Some of the beagles who work in the program are donated by private owners, 
but many are ownerless beagles rescued from animal shelters. Many beagles who were scheduled to be euthanized are now working to keep their country safe from disease. Treated like a queen. Tiffy, a beautiful eight-pound Maltese, is treated like a queen in New York City. Her owner, Nancy Jane Lowy, carefully prepares her meals of lamb, steak, salmon, tuna, chicken, and a variety of fresh vegetables. Tiffy also gets low-fat yogurt and cookies after dinner. Why? Lowy replies, I have a dog because the dog needs me. Lowy, whose husband has a high-paying job and whose two sons are away at school, has the time and money to treat Tiffy extremely well, and she truly enjoys doing so. I want to give her the healthiest, most wonderful life possible for as long as possible. The Animal Carer Jessie is a whippet that visits children who are fighting deadly diseases. She brightens patients' days with love and gives children a chance to exercise. At the National Institutes of Health, Jessie helps patients like young Lucas Parks to stay strong during their long hospitalization. Whether as workers or objects of affection, dogs have certainly proven themselves to be beneficial to humans in many ways. At the same time, their special place as man's best friend has allowed dogs to survive in a human world. While wolves and wild dogs have nearly disappeared from the earth, Domestic dogs continue to grow in number thanks to their special relationship with humans. Three A. Was King Tut murdered? King Tutankhamun was just a teenager when he died. He was the last king of a powerful family that had ruled Egypt for centuries. When he died in 1322 B.C., Tut, as Tutankhamun is often known today, was placed in a luxurious gold-filled tomb. There he lay forgotten until the tomb's eventual discovery in 1922. Although we now know a lot about his life, the reason for Tutankhamun's death at such a young age has remained a mystery, with murder the most extreme possibility. Now, improved X-ray technology is offering new clues into King Tut's death. Discovered and Damaged The British archaeologist Howard Carter opened Tut's tomb in 1922. Although it had been robbed in ancient times, it was still full of gold and other amazing items. Carter spent months carefully recording the treasures. When he and his team then attempted to remove King Tut's mummy, they found that it had become attached to its solid gold coffin. Unfortunately, they did a great deal of damage to the mummy while removing it. Theories about Tut's death In 1968, archaeologists conducted an examination of the mummy using simple X-ray technology. Three important discoveries led to various theories about his death. The X-rays showed that bones in King Tut's chest were missing. Carter hadn't done that damage. Tut was a trained fighter and hunter, so some people have guessed that it was caused by a war injury or a hunting accident. There appeared to be pieces of bone inside the skull, causing many to believe that King Tut was killed by a blow from behind to the head. Was he murdered by people wanting to take control of Egypt? A serious fracture discovered above Tut's left knee could have been the result of an accident or attack. Infection might have started there and killed the boy king. A Closer Look at the Mummy In recent years, scientists, under the direction of Zahi Hawass, head of Egypt's Supreme Council of Antiquities, have applied a new and more effective X-ray technology to mummies throughout Egypt. In the images, each bone appears in perfect detail. So, was King Tut's death murder or accident, infection or war injury? Doctors who analyze the X-ray images say that the skull was mainly undamaged excluding the possibility of a blow to the head. However, while modern technology has been able to rule out one theory, the actual cause of death remains unknown. It seems there are secrets that even the latest technology cannot yet find the answers to. 3B. Who Killed the Iceman? 
In 1991, high in the mountains of Europe, hikers made a gruesome discovery, a dead man partly frozen in the ice. However, the police investigation soon became a scientific one. Carbon dating indicated that the man died over 5,300 years ago. Today, he is known as the Iceman and has been nicknamed Ertzi for the Ertzel Alps where he was found. Kept in perfect condition by the ice, he is the oldest complete human body on Earth. Who was the Iceman? Scientists think he was an important person in his society. An examination of his teeth and skull tells us that he was not a young man. His arms were not the arms of a laborer. His dagger was made of stone, but he carried a copper axe. This implies wealth, and he was probably from the upper classes. We know he could make fire as a fire starting kit was discovered with him. Even the food he had eaten enabled scientists to deduce exactly where in Italy he lived. Clues to an Ancient Murder But why did the Iceman die in such a high and icy place? There have been many theories. Some said he was a lost shepherd. Others thought he was killed in a religious ceremony. Over the years since he was found, tiny scientific discoveries have led to great changes in our understanding of the story of the Iceman. The newest scientific information indicates that he was cruelly murdered. Even five years ago, the story was that he fled up there and walked around in the snow and probably died of exposure, said Klaus Ergel, a scientist at the University of Innsbruck in Austria. Now it's all changed. It's more like a crime scene. A Bloody Discovery In June 2001, an X-ray examination of the body showed a small dark shape beneath the Iceman's left shoulder. It was the stone head of an arrow. It had caused a deadly injury that probably killed him very quickly. In 2003, an Australian scientist discovered the blood of four different people on the clothes of the Iceman. Did a bloody fight take place before his murder? Injuries on his hand and head indicate that this may be true. One theory put forward by archaeologist Walter Leitner says that the Iceman's murder was the end of a fight for power among his people. However, this idea is certainly debatable. Today, the research continues, proving some theories false while opening the door to others. Through scientific research, this oldest member of our human family continues to tell us about his life and the time in which he lived. Four A, Grand Central Terminal. Everything about Grand Central Terminal (GCT), conveniently located in the heart of Manhattan, is remarkable. On an average day, seven hundred thousand people pass in and out of it. The information booth in the main concourse, the huge room that is the focal point of the building, gets as many as a thousand visitors an hour. Standing beside it, you feel that if you stood there long enough, you would eventually see every person you have ever known in your life. It's the town square for eight million people, says GCT spokesperson Dan Brucker. If people get separated in the city, they'll meet at the information booth. GCT's art and style reflect the great economic success of railroad companies before the growth of car and air travel. You could spend years in Grand Central before you discovered all its secrets. Its tennis courts, its hidden railroad cars, its private ground floor apartment, now a bar. Nine stories below the lowest floor that the public gets to see is a basement known as M42. Brucker explains, This is not just the deepest and the biggest, but the most secret basement in the city. During World War II, there were shoot-to-kill orders if you showed up down here. It was where the power came from to move the trains carrying soldiers. Today, one box in the basement holds a small red button, about the size of a coin. Above it is written, Emergency Stop. If you press this button, says Brucker, you could make 125,000 people late for dinner. Above the ground, the main concourse features a ceiling painted to look like the night sky, with stars shining down. Over the years, smoke blackened this beautiful ceiling. Although people thought smoke from trains was the cause, it was actually tobacco smoke. However, it has since been cleaned and now shows its original beauty. In the name of modernization, 
Plans were made to destroy GCT in the 1960s. However, many people objected, and finally, New Yorkers decided GCT was worth saving. In 1976, the U.S. government agreed. It made GCT a national historic landmark, recognizing its importance for all Americans and ensuring its continued protection. Once threatened with destruction, Grand Central Terminal continues to give pleasure to passengers and sightseers in Manhattan. Grand Central Terminal by the numbers. Size. Covers 20 hectares of land, almost 30 soccer fields, 53 kilometers of track, and 44 platforms, more than any other station in the world. Commuters. About 125,000 a day. Visitors. Some 575,000 people a day come just to eat, shop, and sightsee. Oldest business, the Oyster Bar, opened in 1913, the same year as GCT. Meals served in terminal restaurants, 10,000 a day. Newspaper recycled, over 4,500 kilograms a day. Percentage of trains on time, 98. Items in lost and found, 19,000 a year. Four B Mumbai City of Dreams, the vibrant city of Mumbai is a natural first stop for visitors to India's western coast. One could say that Mumbai is the New York of India, says Mumbai native Devaya Abad. It's a place of big opportunities, big contrasts, and big energies. There is always something going on. Previously known as Bombay. The city was renamed Mumbai, derived from the goddess Mumba in 1995, as part of a movement away from colonial names. The traditional cultural center of India, Mumbai is today a very modern city with world-class shopping, restaurants, and business areas. It is also home to Bollywood, the world's largest movie industry. India is a complex country, culturally rich and diverse. If you visit India, be prepared for sensory overload. You will experience a culture of amazing depth and variety. Here are just a few of Mumbai's sites that visitors should not miss. Five-star luxury can be enjoyed at Mumbai's Taj Mahal Palace Hotel. Built in 1903 by Persian Indian businessman Jamsethi Tata. According to local legend, Tata was not permitted to enter the finest British-managed hotel of that time, Wilson's, because of its policy of serving only European guests. In response, he established the Taj with a promise that it would have the world's best service. Ever since, the Taj Mahal Palace has been listed among the world's top hotels. What about Wilson's? It's long gone. Across the street from the Taj is the famous Gateway of India an arch standing about 25 meters high. The monument was built to celebrate the visit to India of England's King George V and Queen Mary in 1911. Sellers and performers, including snake charmers, can be found in the surrounding busy park. At night, lit up by electric lights, the gateway appeals to sightseers and lovers, too. Just a one-hour ferry ride from Mumbai is the Island of Elephanta, the island was named by the Portuguese, supposedly after a huge statue of an elephant that used to be there. It has amazing cave temples cut deeply into the rock, featuring sculptures preserved since the 7th century AD. Visitors leaving Mumbai can board their train at the Victoria Terminus, renamed Chhatrapati Shivaji Terminus. This remarkable station is said to have been India's largest construction project when it was built in 1888. An impressive mixture of British and Indian building styles, the station is preserved today as a World Heritage Site. Five A, the flooding of New Orleans. Hurricane Katrina, which struck the U.S. Gulf Coast in August 2005, was one of the costliest natural disasters in U.S. history, both economically and in terms of lives lost. Damage to the city of New Orleans was estimated at more than $22 billion. 
over one million people were forced out of the city, and nearly 1,500 people lost their lives. The storm arrives. A day before Hurricane Katrina passed close to New Orleans, residents were ordered to leave the city. Unfortunately, tens of thousands of people ignored the order or were unable to leave. When Hurricane Katrina hit, water broke through the system of levees and flood walls constructed by government engineers. Many people in low-lying sectors of the city were forced up onto their roofs by the flood water and waited for help to come by boat or helicopter. Chaos in the city Circumstances soon grew worse. There were not enough police left in the city, so people were not only exposed to dangerous floodwaters, but also to widespread crime. Most of our people were focused on getting people off roofs and out of the water, said one police officer. There were not enough people in the city to rescue and distribute food and water to those who needed help. Looting of stores was common. I've looted, said Matthew 35, but only to keep my family and myself alive. They left us here for days without any food or water, like we were just supposed to die, so we had to loot or die. Waiting for help. A borrowed hotel curtain hung over street signs provided shelter for one large extended family. I was starting to think it was going to be our home forever, Kenneth, 47, said. They told us every day that buses were going to take us to shelters. It was just lies and more lies. People lived without running water or toilets as they waited for help. Dead bodies were left on streets. It was days before the government gained control of the city and the remaining people were taken to safety. Should New Orleans be rebuilt? Some experts believe that rebuilding New Orleans isn't a good idea. Currently, even a hurricane of average strength could cause flooding in the city again. Global warming is raising sea levels each year, and to make things worse, the land beneath New Orleans is sinking at a rate of up to 2.5 centimeters a year. However, despite the risk, two-thirds of the people who left have returned to help rebuild the city they love. Five B tropical cyclones. We call them by sweet-sounding names like Faringa or Katrina, but they are huge rotating storms, 200 to 2,000 kilometers wide, with winds that blow at speeds of more than 100 kilometers per hour. Weather professionals or meteorologists know them as tropical cyclones, but they are called hurricanes in the Caribbean Sea, typhoons in the Pacific Ocean, and cyclones in the Indian Ocean. They occur in both the northern and southern hemispheres. Large ones have destroyed cities and killed hundreds of thousands of people. Birth of a Giant We know that tropical cyclones begin over water that is warmer than 27 degrees Celsius, 80 degrees Fahrenheit, slightly north or south of the Earth's equator. Warm, humid air full of water vapor moves upward. The Earth's rotation causes the growing storm to start to rotate around its center, called the eye. At a certain height, the water vapor condenses, changing to liquid and releasing heat. The heat draws more air and water vapor upward, creating a cycle as air and water vapor rise and liquid water falls. If the cycle speeds up until winds reach 118 kilometers per hour, the storm qualifies as a tropical cyclone. Storm Surge Most deaths in tropical cyclones are caused by storm surge. This is a rise in sea level, sometimes 7 meters or more, caused by the storm pushing against the ocean's surface. Storm surge was to blame for the flooding of New Orleans in 2005. The storm surge of Cyclone Nargis in 2008 in Myanmar pushed seawater nearly four meters deep, some 40 kilometers inland, resulting in many deaths. Difficult to predict. The goal is to know when and where the next tropical cyclone will form. And we can't really do that yet, says David Nolan, a weather researcher from the University of Miami. The direction and strength of tropical cyclones are also difficult to predict, even with computer assistance. 
three-day forecasts are still off by an average of 280 kilometers. Forecasters do know that storms are often energized where ocean water is deep and warm, that high waves tend to reduce their force, and that when tropical cyclones move over land, they begin to die. Long-term forecasts are poor. Small differences in the combination of weather factors lead to very different storms. More accurate forecasting could help people decide to evacuate when a storm is on the way. People often return after an evacuation to find nothing really happened, says storm researcher Shirin Majundar. The solution is to improve forecasting through better science. That's the only way to get people to trust the warnings. Six A, cities beneath the sea. Coral polyps can truly be called the animals that help make the world. For uncounted generations, trillions upon trillions of coral polyps have built structures called reefs, larger in scale than those of any other living beings, including humans. The stone-like material created by these tiny animals becomes limestone, a prized building material that was used to construct the great pyramids of Egypt. Huge deposits of limestone exist underground, beneath the ocean, in islands, and in mountains. Limestone has been used in the construction of countless churches, castles, train stations, and banks, and crushed limestone is a major ingredient of cement. A Variety of Life Living coral reefs are remarkable cities beneath the sea, filled with a rich variety of life. These undersea ecosystems thrive in the warm, shallow oceans near the equator. Among the world's most colorful places, coral reefs are full of brilliantly colored fish and coral covered in wonderful patterns. Reef fish are an important food source for humans and make up a significant percentage of the global fish catch. Threats to Coral Reefs In recent years, various factors have threatened coral reefs and the life that depends on them as their home. Blast fishing is an illegal fishing method which involves setting off bombs in the water to kill as many fish as possible. Its negative effects on a reef are significant. It kills most living things and causes great damage to the reef structure. Fishing with liquid cyanide, a very dangerous and deadly material, is another threat to reef ecosystems, particularly in the Philippines. Fishermen release liquid cyanide into the reef and collect the stunned fish which are then sold for big money to the aquarium market or for consumption in restaurants. The fishermen often break apart the reef to look for hiding fish. The cyanide also kills large numbers of coral polyps, leaving large areas of the reef dead. Reefs are also damaged when coral is taken for building material, jewelry, or aquarium ornaments. Water pollution also results in damage. In addition, the recent warming of the oceans has caused areas of many reefs to turn white. Biologists are concerned that coral may be negatively impacted by further warming. Reasons for Hope Threats to coral reefs are serious, but there is reason to hope that they will manage to survive. If we take steps toward coral reef conservation, it is likely that these tiny creatures, which have survived natural threats for millions of years, will be able to rebuild the damaged reefs that so many ocean animals and plants depend on. Six B, shark attack. Craig Rogers was sitting on his surfboard, scanning the distance for his next wave, when his board suddenly stopped moving. He looked down and was terrified to see a great white shark biting the front of his board. I could have touched its eye with my elbow, says Craig. The shark had surfaced so quietly he hadn't heard a thing. In his horror and confusion, he waved his arms and accidentally cut two of his fingers on the shark's teeth. He then slid off the opposite side of his surfboard into the water. Then, with Craig in the water and blood flowing from his fingers, the five-meter-long shark simply swam away, disappearing into the water below. Although sharks are often categorized as killers that hunt and eat as many humans as they can, this is factually inaccurate. Sharks very rarely kill humans. A person has a greater chance of being struck by lightning or drowning in a bath 
than of being killed by a shark. Only 74 people have been reported killed by great whites in the last century. But great white sharks can reach 6 meters in length and weigh 2,200 kilograms or more. With frightening jaws that can hold up to 3,000 teeth arranged in several rows, they could very easily kill and eat a helpless human in the water. Why is it then that most people survive attacks by great whites? Shark researchers are trying to comprehend the reasons that allow people to escape without being eaten. The most common explanation is that great whites don't see well. It has been thought that they mistake people for the seals or sea lions which make up a large part of their diet. There is reason to doubt this, however. Recent information shows that great whites can actually see very well. Also, when attacking seals, great whites shoot up to the surface and bite with great force. When approaching humans, however, they most often move in slowly and bite less hard. They soon discover that humans are not a high-fat meal. They spit us out because we're too bony, says Aidan Martin, director of ReefQuest Center for Shark Research. Shark researchers like Martin hypothesize that great whites are actually curious animals that like to investigate things. It's possible that they use their bite not only to kill and eat, but also to gather information. Although such an experience is unlucky for people like Craig Rogers, when sharks bite surfboards or other objects or people, they are likely just trying to learn what they are. Seven A, the flower trade. When you purchase cut flowers from your local florist, do you think about where they came from? Common sense might tell you that they were grown close by, because cut flowers can't survive a very long trip. The reality, though, is that your cut flowers might come from places like the Netherlands, Ecuador, or Kenya. The cut flower leader. Flowers can now travel long distances thanks to air freight and high-tech cooling systems. Even the most delicate orchid can be shipped to arrive fresh in most places on Earth. This allows Americans, for example, to import some 70% of the cut flowers they buy. The country that exports the most cut flowers is the Netherlands, which dominates the world cut flower trade. There, seven auction houses handle about 60% of the world's cut flower exports. Some auction houses are very large indeed. Aylesmere, near Amsterdam, is an auction house in the sense that Tokyo is a city or Everest a mountain. Its scale is daunting. About 120 soccer fields would fill its main hangar, which holds five auction halls. 19 million cut flowers are sold here on an average day. The Netherlands is also a world leader in developing new flower varieties. Dutch companies and the government invest a considerable amount of money in flower research. Their scientists try to find ways to lengthen a flower's vase life. They also try to strengthen flowers to prevent them from being damaged while traveling on rough roads and to strengthen flowers' natural fragrance. The Benefits of Climate Despite Holland's dominance of the flower market, there are many places with a better climate for growing flowers, and the climate of Ecuador is almost perfect. Mauricio Davalos is the man responsible for starting Ecuador's flower industry some 20 years ago. Our biggest edge is nature, he claims. Our roses are the best in the world. With predictable rainy periods and 12 hours of sunlight each day, Ecuador's roses are renowned for their large heads and long stems. The flower industry has brought employment opportunities and a stronger economy to regions of the country. My family has TV now. There are radios. Some people have remodeled their houses, says Yolanda Kishpa, 20, who picked roses for four years. In recent years, local growers in Ecuador have faced growing competition from greenhouses built by major international companies. Despite this, Davalos feels that the world cut flower trade is large enough to allow both high-tech international companies and smaller national growers to succeed, at least for the time being. But not all local growers are as optimistic. Lena Hale is an independent rose grower in the United States, whose business is now under constant threat from cheaper imports from large companies. In the 1980s, her father predicted the situation would get worse. 
I see a freight train coming down the track, he warned her, and it's coming straight towards us. Seven B. Perfume. A promise in a bottle. Perfume, says expert perfumer Sophia Grossman, is a promise in a bottle. That promise might be reflected in a perfume's name, joy, pleasures, or beautiful, for example. Millions of dollars are spent on the marketing of a perfume, trying to get customers to connect luxury, attraction, or attitude to a fragrance. Even without all the marketing, fragrance has power over our thoughts and emotions. Some scientists insist that memory and smell are especially closely linked. Certain aromas have the power to call up deep memories. Perfume makers are aware of this and use aromas that can touch us deeply. The power of aromas. Of every 10 new perfumes put on the market, perhaps only one will succeed. It's risky to try, as a company introducing a new fragrance can easily run through a budget of $20 million. Profits, however, can be very high. One successful fragrance, CK1, from designer Calvin Klein, made $250 million in its first year. In the perfume world, an essence is a material with its own special aroma. Some are natural, derived from flowers, plants, or wood, for example. Others are synthetic copies of rare or difficult to obtain essences. According to perfume authority Harry Fremont, a good fragrance is a balance between naturals and synthetics. Naturals give richness and roundness, synthetics backbone and sparkle. Image and marketing. Sephora is France's leading perfume store. In a store of shining stone, metal, and glass, Famous perfumes are displayed and guarded like works of art in the nearby Louvre Museum. Salespeople are dressed entirely in black, and each type of perfume is sold in a distinctly shaped bottle. In perfume sales, the emphasis is on presentation at least as much as on the product. France's main competitor in the global perfume market is the United States, where image is all important. The recent launch in the U.S. of one cologne for men, named after basketball star Michael Jordan, was preceded by a flood of TV commercials and talk show appearances by the player to create plenty of excitement and hype. If you are confused about which perfume to buy, perfumer Annie Buzantian offers this advice. You really can't get an idea whether a perfume works or not until you wear it. It's like the difference between a dress on the hanger and a dress on your body, says Byzantian. And Fremont adds, your first impression is often the right one. 8A Marco Polo in China. The Polos, Marco, his father Niccolo, and his uncle Maffeo had been traveling for three and a half years when they finally achieved their objective, a long-awaited meeting with the powerful Mongol leader Kublai Khan. The historic event took place in 1275 at the Khan's luxurious summer capital in Chengdu, in what is now northern China. As he greeted his tired guests, Kublai Khan was surprisingly informal. Welcome, gentlemen. Please stand up. How have you been? How was the trip? Marco Polo's trip had, in fact, started more than 9,000 kilometers, 5,600 miles, away in Venice when he was just a teenager. His father and uncle already knew Kublai Khan from a previous visit five years earlier, when they had spent a short time in Chengdu. On this second trip, the Polos would stay for 17 years, making themselves useful to the Khan and undertaking various missions and tasks for him. It is likely that the Khan considered it an honor that Europeans, who were rare in China, had made the extremely difficult journey, and he made good use of their skills and knowledge. In the service of Kublai Khan, the most powerful man in people and in lands and in treasure that ever was in the world, Marco was able to learn and experience many things that were new to Europeans. In his travel journal, 
he described Kublai Khan's palace as the greatest he had ever seen. He admired the Khan's recently completed new capital, Daidu, whose streets were so straight and so broad. The city was located in what is now the center of Beijing, and Kublai Khan's city planning can still be perceived in the straight, broad streets of China's modern capital. We learn from Marco Polo that, in the administration of his empire, Kublai Khan made use of a fast and simple message system. Horse riders spaced every 40 kilometers allowed messages to cover 500 kilometers a day. Marco also learned the secret of asbestos cloth, which is made from a mineral and doesn't catch fire. Paper money also took him by surprise, as it was not yet in use in the West at that time. Homes were heated with black stones which burn like logs. These stones were coal, unknown in most of Europe, and they were so plentiful that many people had a hot bath three times a week. Although the Khan did not want his visitors to leave, the Polos finally received permission to return home in 1292. Marco continued his observations on the ocean voyage by way of Sumatra and India. Upon his return, he completed a book about his trip, full of details about his amazing cultural experiences. It was probably the greatest contribution of geographic information ever made to the West about the East. Eight B, the travels of Ibn Battuta. I left Tangier, my birthplace, the thirteenth of June, thirteen twenty-five, with the intention of making the pilgrimage to Mecca, to leave all my friends, both female and male, to abandon my home as birds abandon their nests. So begins an old manuscript in a library in Paris, the travel journal of Ibn Battuta. Almost two centuries before Columbus, this young Moroccan set off for Mecca, returning home three decades later as one of history's great travelers. Driven by curiosity, he journeyed to remote corners of the Islamic world, traveling through 44 modern countries, three times as far as Marco Polo. Little celebrated in the West, his name is well known among Arabs. In his hometown of Tangiers, a square, a hotel, a cafe, a ferry boat, and even a hamburger are named after him. Ibn Battuta stayed in Mecca as a student for several years, but the urge to travel soon took over. In one adventure, he traveled to India seeking profitable employment with the Sultan of Delhi. On the way, he described his group being attacked in the open country by eighty men on foot and two horsemen. We fought, killing one of their horsemen and about twelve of the foot soldiers. I was hit by an arrow and my horse by another, but God in his grace preserved me. We carried the heads of the slain to the castle of Abu Bakr and suspended them from the wall. In Delhi, the Sultan gave him the position of judge based on his prior study at Mecca. But the Sultan had an unpredictable character, and Ibn Battuta looked for an opportunity to leave. When the Sultan offered to finance a trip to China, he agreed. Ibn Battuta set off in three ships, but misfortune struck while he was still on the shore. A sudden storm grounded and broke up two ships, scattering treasure and drowning many people and horses. As he watched, the third ship, with all his belongings and slaves, one carrying his child, was carried out to sea and never heard from again. After a lifetime of incredible adventures, Ibn Battuta was finally ordered by the Sultan of Morocco to return home to share his wisdom with the world. Fortunately, he consented and wrote a book that has been translated into numerous languages, allowing people everywhere to read about his unparalleled journeys. 9a. Giants of the Ring The two wrestlers take some time to stare each other down. Then, suddenly, they spring forward and impact with great force in the middle of the ring, slapping, pushing, tripping, gripping the belt, and throwing the other wrestler are all allowed, but punching and kicking are not. The first person to be knocked down or pushed out of the ring loses. The entire match usually lasts less than a minute. 
The sport of sumo is Japan's traditional style of wrestling, and it is one of the oldest organized sports on earth. Sumo matches were taking place in the 7th century AD. The basic elements of modern sumo began to fall into place in the 1680s, and the sport remains little changed since then. Bigger is better. Sumo wrestlers are huge men by any standard. Their average weight is 160 kilos, and there is no weight restriction. The Hawaiian Salivaha Tisanoa, whose sumo name is Konishki, weighed over 280 kilos when he was a successful wrestler. To achieve such impressive dimensions, sumo wrestlers eat large quantities of chankonabe, a Japanese stew whose ingredients include vegetables, chicken, fish, tofu, or beef. In the ring, they wear, without shame, little more than a traditional silk belt called a mawashi. Their hair is styled in a fashion popular with 17th century samurai. Ancient Traditions Sumo matches are rich in tradition. The wrestling ring, called the dohyo, is exactly 4.55 meters across. Above it hangs a beautiful shrine roof that illustrates Sumu's close association with Japan's Shinto religion. Wrestlers throw salt onto the ring before each match, a religious tradition believed to make the ground pure. Overseeing the fight is the gyoji, an official dressed in wonderful traditional clothes who closely watches and sometimes encourages the wrestlers. Foreigners in Sumo As Japan becomes more internationalized, so too does the world of sumo. Wrestlers from Mongolia, Korea, Russia, the United States, Argentina, and other countries have taken their turn in the ring. It's not surprising that so many people are entering the sport, since professional sumo wrestlers enjoy many benefits. Top wrestlers are national heroes and can earn more than $1 million annually. Some have even married movie stars. Foreign wrestlers once found it difficult to advance in sumo. Konishki once complained to the press, If I were Japanese, I'd be a grand champion now. But since then, four wrestlers of foreign origin have become grand champions, or Yokozuna, the top level of sumo wrestler. Few other sports have been so successful at keeping their traditional roots while still appealing to a 21st century audience. For this reason, the ancient and the modern will continue to meet in the sumo ring. Nine B, Bride of the Sahara, the Tureg Bride Aslama sits silently as female relatives and helpers make sure that every hair is perfect for the first day of her wedding celebration. Such attention is new for the bride, who is only fifteen years old and who has spent most of her time tending her mother's goats and sheep. The Tureg are nomads, and it was only by chance that she was reunited with her twenty-five-year-old cousin Mohammed a month earlier. Just back from five years working in Libya, Mohammed spotted Aslama as she drew water from a well. I knew from that moment that I wanted to marry her, he says. Wasting no time, he asked for her hand, she accepted, their families approved, and wedding plans began. Following Tureg traditions, the marriage rite is performed at a nearby mosque in the presence of only the couple's parents. Aslama and Mohammed are absent. A few days later, the time for the celebration approaches, and guests begin to arrive. For a week, some 500 guests enjoy camel races, sing and eat rice, dates and roasted meat in tents under the Saharan stars. Mohammed wears an indigo tagalmust, a cloth that wraps his head and face. The rich color which rubs off onto the skin earned these once fierce Saharan warriors the title Blue Men of the Desert. For the Tureg, the Tagalmust is more than just clothing that keeps out the desert sand and sun. It demonstrates respect and is thought to keep evil creatures known as jinns away, as is henna, a reddish-brown coloring used on Mohammed's feet. Henna is also a symbol of purity and is reserved for a man's first marriage. At the celebration, a tent called an ihain is prepared for Aslama and Mohammed. Women take down and put up the tent every day of the celebration, making it slightly larger each time, to symbolize the progress of the celebration and of the couple's relationship. 
Aslama stays inside the tent during the whole celebration, only showing her face or speaking to Mohammed, her best friend, her mother, and one special helper. During the celebration, neither Aslama nor Mohammed is ever left alone for fear they might be harmed by jealous jinns. As the celebration ends, the couple prepares to spend the first year of their marriage with Aslama's family. Mohammed will offer displays of respect to his in-laws, working hard to win their approval. Once he does that, he will take his bride back to his camp and start his nomad's caravan moving again. Ten A, the Big Thaw. The Chacaltaya ski area in Bolivia used to be the highest in the world. Although it was less than a kilometer long, it hosted international ski competitions. Today, the snow has almost gone, and so have Chacaltaya's days as a popular ski resort. The ski area sits upon a small mountain glacier, which was already getting smaller when the ski area opened in 1939. In the past ten years, however, The glacier has been melting at an increased rate. As the glacier melts, dark rocks beneath it are uncovered. The sun then heats the rocks, causing faster melting. Despite attempts to make snow with snow machines, this cycle seems unstoppable in the long run. As experts debate how to solve the global warming problem, ice in mountains such as Chacaltaya and near the North and South Poles is melting faster than even the most pessimistic environmentalists may have once feared. Rising air and sea temperatures are two well-known causes, but researchers have recently discovered other unexpected processes that take place as glaciers melt. The effects are having an impact on humans even now, and they could change the face of the world in the future. Serious consequences: the glaciers of the Himalayas and the Andes could disappear in this century. As a result, the millions of people in India, Bolivia, and Peru. Who now depend on melting water from mountain glaciers could find themselves in a critical situation. The ice sheet of Greenland is also melting more quickly than scientists predicted. Greenland's largest outlet glacier, the Yagabshavn Ispay glacier, is moving toward the sea twice as fast as it was in 1995. One cause could be meltwater that runs down to the bottom of the glacier and gets between the ice and the rock below. This water makes it easier for the glacier to slide along to the ocean. Many ice researchers believe that Greenland's melting, if it continues, will add at least three feet to global sea levels by the year 2100. If the ice sheet of Antarctica, now largely unaffected, begins to melt, the next few centuries could see a six-foot rise in sea levels, forcing tens of millions of people out of their homes. How can we avoid these dire consequences of global warming? We have to have a serious and immediate shift in attitude," says Laurie David, producer of the prize-winning movie *An Inconvenient Truth*, which helped to raise awareness of the problem. Many believe that an attitude of hope and a desire to stay informed make a good beginning. An informed public is in a better position to help address this critical issue. Ten B, last days of the ice hunters. Jens Danielson kneels on his dog sled as it slides along the rough edge of a frozen sea. Haru, Haru, he calls out urgently. Go left, go left. Atsuk, Atsuk. Go right, go right. The fifteen dogs in his team move carefully. Despite freezing temperatures in late March, the ice has broken up, making travel dangerous. The sea ice used to be three feet thick here, Danielson says. Now it's only four inches thick. As big as a bear and with a kind, boyish face, Danielson is a 45-year-old ice hunter from Kanok, a village of about 650 people, whose brightly painted houses cover a hillside overlooking a fjord. He's heading toward the ice edge to find walruses, as hunters of Inuit ethnicity have done for as long as memory. With his extended family and 57 dogs to feed, he'll need to kill several walruses on this trip. Normally, the ice comes to northwestern Greenland in September and stays until June, 
But during the past few years, the ice has been thick and the hunting good for only three or four weeks. The ice shelf gives hunters access to the walruses, seals, and whales they hunt. Without it, hunting becomes nearly impossible. In one recent winter, Canucks hunters found themselves without sufficient food to feed their starving dogs. The hunters asked for help, and the government responded with money, while fishing corporations assisted by sending fish by airplane. Today, fewer than 500 ice hunters are able to live by hunting alone. They travel by dog sled, wear skins, and hunt with harpoons. At the same time, they also use guns, cell phones, and watch TV. This changing weather is bad for us, Danielson says, scowling. Some of our people have to go other ways to make a living. His wife, Elechuk, who used to go with him on these hunting trips, has had to take a job at a daycare center in Canuck to help pay their bills. The government now funds job training programs to help ice hunters find other employment. Warmer weather does provide some opportunities. Quantities of valuable fish that prefer warmer water are increasing, and melting ice has uncovered some of Greenland's valuable natural resources, minerals, metals, and gems. Electric power plants may soon be built on rivers filled by melting ice, but the last ice hunters may not be able to get used to working as fishermen, in mines, or in power plants. As Danielson says, without ice, we can't live. Without ice, we're nothing at all. Eleven A, Army ants, forget lions, tigers, and bears. When it comes to the art of war, army ants are among the most frightening creatures on earth. With powerful mouthparts, these fighters can skillfully cut creatures much larger than themselves into pieces. Acting together in great numbers, army ant colonies succeed at making tens of thousands of such kills each day. Their capabilities do have limits, though. Contrary to popular belief, they almost never take down large animals or people. One of the best places to observe army ants is Barro, Colorado, an island in a lake created by the Panama Canal. The island is home to as many as 50 colonies of Eseton burchelli, the most studied army ant in the world. It is one of 150 types of army ants in the New World. More than 170 other types live in Asia, Africa, and Australia. The colonies of this army ant are huge, ranging from 300,000 to 700,000 ants. They never stay in one place long, moving from nest site to nest site. Linking legs together, they use their own bodies to form enormous nests called bivouacs, which they hang beneath a fallen tree. There they stay for about 20 days as the queen lays as many as 300,000 eggs. When the ants go hunting, as many as 200,000 of them leave the nest in a group that broadens into a fan as wide as 14 meters. This swarm raid takes a slightly different course each day, allowing the hunters to cover fresh ground each time. Protecting the ants wherever they go are the soldiers, recognizable by their oversized jaws. If their frightening looks don't scare enemies away, soldiers also have a powerful bite, and the attack is often suicidal. Because their jaws are shaped like fish hooks, the soldiers can't pull them out again. Amazonian tribes have used soldier ants to close wounds, breaking off the bodies and leaving the heads in place. Eseton burchelli are blind and can't see what's ahead of them, but they move together in such great numbers that they easily kill the non-army ants, insects, and other small creatures that constitute their prey. When the group happens upon a break in the path, Ants immediately link legs together and form a living bridge so that the group can move forward without any delay. In Japanese, the word ant is written by linking two characters, one meaning insect, the other meaning loyalty. Indeed, individual ants are completely loyal to their fellow ants. They display many examples of selfless cooperation that, while certainly extreme, can't fail to win human admiration. 11b. The Beauty of Moths 
For many people, moths are swarming, dust-colored pests that eat our clothes and disturb us by flying around lights after dark. Not for artist Joseph Shear. The images he creates bring out the beauty of moths, with colors, shapes, and patterns that have never before been seen so clearly. Digital tools let you see things you'd never see just looking with your eyes, Shear says. Shear's images have been displayed around the world, and one reaction is heard everywhere. People insist, no, that can't be a moth, says Shear. One Swiss viewer credited the insect's lovely variety to their exotic American origin. We don't have such nice moths in our country, he declared. In fact, every country has moths that can amaze. Moth hunting. The process began with a moth hunt in the state of New York. Shear would leave the lights on and the windows open overnight at his university office, then collect the moths that had flown in when he returned in the morning. When the building cleaners at the university complained, he moved the hunt to his friend Mark Klingensmith's yard. Mark's a gardener with lots of stuff growing on his property, Shear says. Moths like it. They set up two lights shining over a plastic container on a white sheet. Then they watched, astounded, as moths emerged from the darkness, flew carelessly into the sheet, and fell into the plastic container. We got a different species every night, that first season, Shear says. The patterns and colors were overwhelming. Scanning the details. Using a powerful scanner designed for camera film, they were able to capture detailed pictures of moths. Small moths present special challenges. One twitch of the finger, and there goes a wing, says Shear. I try to drink less coffee when I'm working on them. The scanner records so much information that a single moth can take 20 minutes to scan. A scan of just two small moths fills an entire CD. All that information means the size of the image can be increased 2,700 percent, but still retain all the details and appear perfectly clear. You'd need a microscope to see the details shown in Shear's prints. Shear's work is not only a new form of art. He can also be congratulated for making a valuable contribution to the record of moths where he lives. He has helped identify more than a thousand different species, not from Alaska or the Amazon, Klingensmith says, all from one backyard. Twelve A, private space flight. Airplane designer Bert Rutan was 14 years old when the USSR launched Sputnik 1. He believed that government research into space travel would someday mean he too would be able to journey to space. By the mid 1990s, however, Rutan had realized that waiting for the government wasn't going to work. It was then that he resolved to build his own spaceship. If my dream was going to come true, a floating weightless in the black sky and being thrilled by the sight of Earth from outside our atmosphere, I'd have to get things started myself, said Rutan. The Dream of Space Flight Rutan was encouraged to build his own spaceship by the history of airplane design itself. Five years after the Wright brothers' first flight in 1903, the airplane was still just a dangerous curiosity. Only a dozen or so people had tried flying in an airplane. Yet by 1912, Hundreds of pilots had flown airplanes of different designs that were developed through private enterprise. The bad designs crashed. The good designs flew. Soon, factories in France, England, and Germany were producing hundreds and then thousands of airplanes a year. Why? I believe the answer lay in two observations. That's got to be fun, and maybe I can do that, says Rutan. The dream becomes real. Rutan's optimism finally paid off. In 2004, his specially designed spaceship, Spaceship One, successfully entered space and made it back to Earth twice in two weeks. Those were the requirements to win the $10 million Ansari X Prize, a prize designed to encourage the development of private space travel. Rutan's success got the world's attention, and various schemes to commercialize private space travel began to appear. An Incredible Opportunity 
In one such scheme, Sir Richard Branson has licensed the technology of Spaceship One for his company, Virgin Galactic, which hopes to offer people of all shapes, sizes, and ages the opportunity to visit space. Virgin's first spaceships will have two pilots and six passengers aboard. Passengers will float weightless in space for six thrilling minutes as they gaze out at space through a large window. Of all the things we've done, Branson says, Virgin Galactic is the one I'm most excited about. Every time I look up in the sky at night, I think about how incredible the opportunity is. People have been waiting for this moment for thousands of years. Twelve B, the deepest cave. When Sergio Garcia Diaz de la Vega kissed his girlfriend goodbye at the entrance to Crubera Cave, he promised to return the next day. But it would be two long weeks before he met her again. Garcia Diaz was a member of an international team exploring Crubera. The team members hoped to be the first cavers to reach a depth of two thousand meters, a feat that would be compared to conquering the North and South Poles. During the descent, team member Bernard Torte injured himself going through a tight passage. Garcia Diaz decided to stay with him at an underground camp, missing the chance to return to the surface before the team descended further. Crubera Cave in the Western Caucasus Mountains is the deepest known cave in the world. Descending into Crubera, one team member said, was like climbing an inverted Mount Everest. The team members brought five tons of equipment and other necessities with them, and established camps at key locations along the route. They cooked meals together, slept five and six to a tent, and worked for up to twenty hours each day. They left ropes behind to ease their return ascent and telephone lines to communicate with people above. In the third week, progress was blocked at one thousand seven hundred seventy-five meters by a sump. A cave passage filled with water that gives cavers few options. There are basically three techniques available: dive through it, empty it, or go around it. Gennady Samukin dove to the bottom but was disappointed. No chance to get through, he said. Searching for a way around the sump, Garcia Diaz risked entering a cascade of near freezing water and discovered that his dry suit had holes in it. The water was so cold, I lost the feeling in my fingers. He said later, he too was unsuccessful. Finally, two teammates found a way around the sump through a tight passage they called the Way to the Dream. The team was exhilarated. The passage led to yet another sump at one thousand eight hundred forty meters. After a short test dive, Samukin emerged smiling. There was a promising passage, he reported, but it would have to wait. After nearly four weeks with supplies running low, the team had run out of time and would have to return to the surface. Four weeks later, a team of nine Ukrainian cavers led by Yuri Kazjan went back to Krubera. Following the path opened by the previous team, they reached the sump at one thousand eight hundred forty meters relatively quickly. After much searching, a pit later named the Millennium Pit was discovered that allowed them to pass the two thousand meter depth. More pits and passages led them to 2,080 meters, a spot they named "Game Over." But the caving game is never over. Deeper caves will probably continue to be discovered and call out to be explored.